Well, good morning. Hey, you can't hear me through this thing. I would say happy Father's Day. But since we did not get to celebrate Mother's Day, we're going to call this FAMO Day. And we're going to celebrate fathers and mothers and recognize how important they are to us during this time because of the situations that we seem to be enjoying right now as far as that's concerned. But we are so grateful for our fathers and our mothers. I'm grateful to be a father, not a mother. Uh, but, you know, realize just how important those two people are to the spread of Christianity throughout the world because they are the primary source of bringing the teachings about Jesus, sharing it with their children as they grow up because at early stages of life, they're the one people that, 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 uh, that children will listen to as their parents, you know, from there. And so thankful that God, many of you can celebrate. We've had wonderful parents, wonderful fathers and mothers that has brought us up in our relationship with the Lord. And so today we're honored to be able to honor parents that have come and, and, and taken that responsibility upon their lives and bringing their families to the children. I'm glad that you're here this morning. Uh, every Sunday we seem to uh, have a, a little, few more, a little less as we go through. I appreciate the fact that you're uh, honoring what we've asked you to do with social distancing as much as possible uh, and, uh, and trying not to hug and kiss any more than, than you absolutely have to uh, through that process. But we're glad to be able to be back together and worshiping in God's house. Uh, we're here to give him the glory for it all. So let's pray, and then we're going to sing together. Father, we thank you so much for the, the privilege of being able to come together to worship. And Lord, we come here today knowing that each one of us has needs and concerns in our lives. But Lord, we're putting those aside right now. We're here for one reason, and that's to give you the glory. Because you alone are worthy. So we come together to praise you and to hear from your word, to honor you from the way that we uh, conduct ourselves. But more than anything else, just because you loved us first. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Jason? Well, let me echo what Wally said. Happy Mother's Father's. Would you call it FOMO? FOMO. Happy FOMO Day. FOMO. FOMO. <laughs> all right, let's stand and let's worship together this morning. Oh, and I heard a thousand in stories of what they think you're like but I heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone you're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Oh, and I.
praise to you only. Great are you. Let's pray together this morning. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you for this time. We can worship you together this morning through through singing praises to you, through the reading of your word, preaching of your word, through giving, through every avenue that we use this morning. We just want to give you praise. It's in your holy and precious name. Amen. Let's be seated this morning. It's on now. I know y'all dread it when you see me get up here because you know I'm going to talk. Well, I had tried not to talk for quite a while, but I can't not say anything this morning because hallelujah, praise God, we're back in God's house this morning. I have missed my church family. I have missed you so, so much. I love you. I love you. This morning, the song I'm going to sing, God just put it there, I guess, because it goes with the times. It's just an old Beautiful, wonderful hymn that is dear to my heart, but with the way that the world is going and the people in it. It's probably going to get a lot worse before it gets better. But praise God, one day, what a day that will be. And it's also appropriate for Father's Day because one day we're going to see our Heavenly Father face to face. What a day that will be. If you know it, you can sing with me. Peace for 
It is good to be able to be together, to see face to face and worship together. This morning we continue to look at the book of James. We are in the fourth chapter, and I thought it was kind of interesting. You know, if somebody asked me over the years, you know, periodically, you have one of those pastor questions, you know, that people want to ask you, and uh, someone, I was speaking to someone one time, they said, well, you know, if somebody came up to you and said, if they can only read one book of the Bible, what book should they read? And I said, well, it depends. It depends on whether that person is lost or that person is saved. If that person is not a believer, then they need to read the book of John. They need to read it, study it, immerse themselves in the book of John. If that person is a believer, then they need to immerse themselves in the book of James. Because John is going to introduce them to Jesus. It's going to teach them about Jesus. They're going to have an understanding of what Jesus did and, and, and what salvation is and how it means. James is going to tell us, as I've told you over and over again, it's going to tell us how we should live as Christians, how we should live as believers. You know, we've, over the last several weeks, we have, uh, he's taught us about how to deal with trials and temptations that come into our lives on a, a daily basis, how to hear the word and not just hear it, but do it at the same time, and, and then how not to how not to show favoritism to other people just because they're different than us. How we're supposed to connect faith and deeds, not either or or both and. Last, uh, we talked about the tongue, taming the tongue, that wild animal that each of us has in each of our bodies. And then last time we looked at what real true wisdom was. Well, you know, in any family, there are conflicts in the family. There are challenges within family. I grew up with two older sisters. And uh, I always told Kathy, I said, you know, when it got around to us to have children, if our first two children were girls, there was not going to be a third, you know, because I was not going to put another boy through that. Of course, all my sisters always said, you were an accident anyway uh, from there, since there was 12 or seven years between me and her. But uh, there always, you know, there are disagreements and things that happen with the family. The Christian family is no different. Uh, among believers, there are challenges. Uh, this being uh, FAMO Day, I, when I looked at the first verse in this scripture, I thought, well, that really doesn't have a subtle meaning to it. Because if you look at first verse of chapter 4, the first thing it says is what causes fights and quarrels among you. And that's not directed at husbands and wives. It's directed at believers. It is directed at believers. So it goes on to say this. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Now, so this is specifically, everything in James is designed to focus upon believers and what they should do and how they should do it. He in this, he refers back to chapters 2 where we looked at, remember when it talked about favoritism, how we treated people differently because of their status in life or you know, where they were important and where they were not. You know, uh, those, those are class wars. And how we're supposed to avoid those. You look back through biblical history. Uh, you look at the Lot and Abraham. You know, the, the, the challenge that took place in that family there. You look at David and Absalom. You know, there's there always conflicts can occur even in the best of, of believers' families. But it's a personal conflict. Remember we talked about in chapter 3, what was the root of all those things? And it was two things. It was bitter envy and selfish ambition. Bitter envy and selfish ambition in the lives of each person. And of course, you know, as uh, what is it, Alice Trebek says on the commercial on television about life insurance for us old people, he says, remember the three P's, you know, which is price, price, and price. Well, in this one, we need to remember the three P's. It's pride, pride, and pride. Because pride is at the root of most conflicts that take place in some way or another. Scripture in Proverbs says, where there is strife, there is pride. That is usually having something to do with it from there. See, pride is a disease of the heart. You know, it is an, it's an internal disease. Uh, a, a person may appear to live a life of humility. You know, he may appear to be, you know, totally a, a, humil, hum, a person with humility, you know, but while all the time that same person may harbor in his heart a vast contempt for his fellow man, he may see himself as superior or better or something. You know, a person who is filled with pride does not know his own need. 
You know, he, he, he thinks that uh, I have no need that somebody else need to supply. I am totally self-sufficient. A person who's filled with pride cherishes his own independence. I don't need anybody. You know, I'm not going to be beholden to anyone else. You know, not even to God. You know, I'm not going to owe anybody anything. A, a person who's filled with pride, <clears throat> excuse me, doesn't recognize their own sin. They don't recognize their sin. They think everything about them is, is all hunky-dory. It is good. And lastly, a person who's filled with, with pride cannot receive help. You know why they cannot receive help? Because he doesn't know he needs help. And so he doesn't know he needs help, so he won't ask for it. He won't ask for it. He goes on to verse 2 <clears throat> and says, You lust, but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have, because you do not ask God. <clears throat> Excuse me. That desire is lust. You know, it's not just like or want. It is lust. It is an innate desire to have something, you know, focused in on it. And, and you can't have it. Because why? Because you have wrong motives. You know, your wrong motives. We're going to talk about those in a minute. When you covet, you want something that somebody else has. Something that, that you don't have and you think you deserve it and go through there. See, the problem is <clears throat> when you desire the lust and the covet, those are tools of sin. Those are tools of sin that work in our lives. But the latter part of that verse says you do not have because you do not ask. Those are tools of the Spirit. Because see, most people, our prayer life is lacking. You know, we don't, we don't spend enough time in prayer. We don't spend enough time praying for the right things. You know, we tend to, to take a hit and miss approach to it. But if you know, we want to experience the blessing that God has for us, we have to learn how to ask. Verse 3 says, when you ask, you do not receive. Why? Because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. Wrong motives, it's selfish and personal gain. You know, too often when we pray, it sounds an awful, awful lot more rather than we're asking God for the good things that he has for us, that we're spending more time telling God what we want him to do. You know, we're telling God what he should do and how he should do it and going through that process. We, you know, we, we have that desire and that covetousness even in our prayer lives. And we wonder why our prayers are not answered. But uh, uh, 1 John five fourteen tells us, it says that this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And that if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of him. See, we need to learn to forget our own will. We need to learn to forget our own desire and to seek the will of God in all things. If we can learn to do that, then we can begin to receive the blessings that God has for us because we're praying for things that he's already decided he was going to give us anyway as long as we ask for them. See, when our praying is wrong, when our praying is, is distorted in that manner, then our whole Christian life is wrong. Our whole attitude about our relationship with God is wrong. He goes on to say in verse 4, you adulterous people, you know, often the scripture uses that to refer to people who are, are, are double-minded, people who are trying to worship God and man at the same time. He talks it like a, a, a broken down uh, uh, relationship. It's an adulterous relationship. He says, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Now, enmity is, is, is a word that's it's small. It doesn't seem to carry a whole lot. But if you look at the real reason behind it, the meaning from it, what enmity means is basically this. He who loves the world hates God. You know, he who loves the world hates God. It's as simple as that. That's the, what is designed if we have friendship with the world, if we engage with the world. It says, therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. They commit spiritual adultery from there. Uh, and we don't just decide, you know, like tomorrow, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to develop a friendship with the world today. You know, it's something that begins, it happens over a period of time. It weasels its way into our lives. You know, we look at things and we say, well, that's not so bad. You know, that's, that's not, that's not a, you know, a, a, an end of the world type thing. We can, we can play with that a little bit. You know, we can allow that to come in there. You know, or, or well, you know, I, I watched that television show and you know, it, it had some bird, bad words in them, but, but they, they weren't so bad. You know, they, I, I hear them at Walmart every day, you know. 
or, or something like that. You know, we just, it, it begins gradually and, and it, it begins to accelerate in our lives, you know, when we go through that process. You know, it's not something that happens just all of a sudden, swim, you are now a friend of the world. But we allow the world to weasel its way uh, into our lives. It happens one step at a time. You see, the, 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 the root cause of a broken relationship with God is rebellion against God. We decide we know what's best, not what God teaches us or what the Scripture says, but what we know what is best, what feels good to us, what, what we think is okay. Verse 5 says, but, Or do you think Scripture says without reason that He jealously longs for the Spirit He has caused to dwell in us? What does that really say? God is a jealous God. Now, we have a negative connotation to the word jealousy in the world we live in. But what it really comes across as meaning to us is that God loves us more than anything else. And He knows what is best for us. And He wants to protect us against those things in the world that He knows that are not good for us. And so He wants to protect that relationship. And so He is jealous for our commitment to Him. No one can serve two masters. No one can serve two masters, and many of us seem to try to do it all the time. But the, the blessing in this is, though, is that God never gives up on us. Even when we wander off course, God never gives up on us. He will constantly give us more opportunities to come back to Him and to establish that right relationship with Him again. You know, the one, one person you can count on not giving up on you is God because He wants that relationship to be. And so as the verse says, you think he says that without any reason behind it? No, he says it because of the love that's behind it and what he wants to be in that relationship. Verse 6 says, but he gives us more grace. That's why scripture said God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. So, looking at those verses, it seems pretty obvious that what we need to do in order to avoid conflicts and, and, and uh, uh, difficulties within the family of God is that we all need to develop a, a strong, overpowering dose of humility. You know, okay, the world we live in today is not really big on humility, you know. But so how do we, how do we develop humility? How do we develop the right kind of humility that we as the children of God should have? Well, he doesn't leave us hanging. He goes on to tell us about it. In verse 7, the, he, he begins to lay it out for you. <clears throat> he said, the first thing is, submit yourselves then to God. Oh, there's that word. You know, there's that word. Submit. You know, we're not, we're not really happy with submitting. You know, because submitting means that we have to accept that uh, we need something or that we're not as great as something else. You know, we're going to submit to something else's authority. You know, it's like the little boy that, you know, his mother disciplined him because he was misbehaving and she put him in the corner and told him to sit in the chair in the corner. And his response to her was, you know, I may be sitting in the chair, but I'm standing up on the inside. You know, we, we resist, you know, we resist submitting to anything else. But you know what it means when we submit to God? It means that we come to the point in our lives where we say, I am no longer the greatest thing in my life. I am no longer the greatest thing in my life. We, we accept our own personal inability to meet our own needs. That's what submitting to God means is that we understand, you know, that, that God is greater than us. What is it, the, the, what was it, the old thing, the movie Roots? You know, when, when the guy took the baby and went outside and held him up to the sky when the child was born and said, Behold, the only thing greater than you. You know, sometimes we forget to recognize that God is far greater than us. You know, that God is far greater than us. And we accept that ability that we need him. We sang tonight, I need you. You know, how I need you. You know, we don't like to even expect to accept the fact that we need other people or other things. And we desperately need God. The world that we're in right now desperately needs God. But because of pride and all of our self-assuredness, you know, we don't need anything. We can take care of it. We'll handle it on our own. And that's how we got into the mess that we're in right now. You know, we need to, to submit to God. The second thing is we need to resist the devil and he will flee from you. That is a great statement. 
Resist the devil. How do we resist the devil? We depend upon God. You know, the devil will make a liar out of us real quickly if we think that we can handle this stuff on our own strength. We come up. Years ago, I took about 40 kids to the, to the, uh, the zoo, the Atlanta Zoo. You know, took them, you know, which was a crazy thing to do, trying to, you know, it's like herding cats, you know, but going to the zoo. Had a young boy who went with us. This is his first time going out with this, with our, our, our terrific Tuesday group. He's pretty shy. He was my, 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 uh, uh, my uh, eye doctor's son. And Ben was real shy. He, you know, he's kind of protected. And so I kept Ben with me during the day, and he was more than willing to stay with me as we were in town. And, and I don't know if you've ever been to the Atlanta Zoo, but they have an ape encounter there. And if it's still the same way it used to be, you go inside this building and you get to stand in front of these big windows and you can see the, the, the apes out in the, the playground from there. So of course, I'm really thankful for the fact that glass is four inch thick, you know, from there. Because they used to have a silverback gorilla there. You know, he was there forever. Massive, massive gorilla. And he, he's famous. You know, I've, if I was could remember his name you would even recognize his name because he was that way and and so we were standing there Ben and I were standing there in front of that glass you know watching him just standing there watching him and that gorilla decided he would come down where we were and he kept coming closer and closer and closer and he got right up to the glass and he's standing right in front of us you know and I'm sitting there watching Ben thinking that he's fixing to turn and run you know and that gorilla reached up with his big hand and slammed it against that glass. You know, not, you know, just slammed it against it. And I said, oh, Ben's gone now, you know. But you know what he did? At that moment, he reached up and slipped his hand into my hand, you know. And that's all it took for him, you know, to be able to stay there and confront that gorilla. He just slipped his hand. See, this is what we need to do. When we have to confront sin, we confront Satan's challenges upon our lives, then we need to slip our hand into God's hand. Because he ain't moving. You know, he's not going anywhere. And so we need to reach up and feel him. And know that's what it means when we need to resist the devil. We sit there, you know, we might, might say ourselves, well, I can't handle the devil. I ain't hanging around here, you know. But what we can do is slip our hands into God to say, hey, see who I got with me? He's bigger than you. And so I can stand in the face of whatever you're bringing. 2 Corinthians 12 says, But he says to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake I delight in weakness, in insults, and in hardships, in persecutions, and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When I am weak, then I am strong. The next thing we need to do is it says here, come near to God. Now, you know, that's, that's, that's a great statement. We need to come near to God. But I love the second half of that statement because it says, come near to God and he will come near to you. No one has ever come to God and gone away empty handed. No one has ever come to God and God did not meet them. Did not come to them. It says, wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. The scripture tells us, seek me and seek me with all your heart and you will find me. <clears throat> Doesn't say you might find me. If I got time, you'll find me. It says, no, you seek me diligently and you will find me. What does it mean when it says wash your hands? <clears throat> We're getting real, real familiar with washing hands. You know, every, here we go. I don't think I'd ever be at the point where I carried a, a jar of hand sanitizer in the door part, pocket of my door in my car, you know, from there. We're, we like washing hands now. But what he means by <clears throat> washing hands is we need to fix our lifestyle. We need to wash those things out of our lives that are getting between us and God. You know, we need, we need to rid ourselves of the impurities that this world has put upon us. <clears throat> we need to purify our hearts. And that refers to our motives. We need to purify our motives. We need to become singular in our purpose. We need, to be, we need to be focused on pleasing God in all that we do. After all, if he is Lord of our lives, if he is our king, then we need to please him in all that we do. Because you need to understand, God will not share us. He will not share us. He wants to be Lord 
of all. And so those are the things that we need to do. We need to come near to God and he will respond to that. The, the, verse 9 says that we need to grieve, mourn, and wail. We need to change our laughter to mourning and enjoy the gloom. You say, wait a minute. Why, why all of a sudden are we, are we going to this gloom and doom business? Because that is a correct response when we're confronted with the sin that's in our lives. When we realize the sin that's in our lives, we should not be happy about it. We should, we should grieve. And that should lead us to repentance. Psalms 51 is one of the most powerful psalms uh, that was ever written. It was written presumably by David after he had been confronted and committed his adultery with Bathsheba. And he came to that point of realizing what he had done and asking for God's forgiveness. So listen to this psalm. It will take me a minute to read it because it's not short. But he starts out by saying this in verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. Remember, this is the king who is a man after God's own heart. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are God my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. Do not, you do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. We need to have that same reaction in our lives when we look at the sin that is in our lives. It needs to break our heart. What is a contrite heart? I looked that up this morning. That's not a word that we use all the time. But a person whose heart is contrite is a person who has been confronted with their sin and they realize the horror of the sin that's in their lives, however large or small it is, and realize the only hope they have is the mercy of God's forgiveness. And they understand that. Verse 10 says, Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will lift you up. Matthew 18 says, Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 23 says, For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. 1 Peter 5 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that He may lift you up in due time. Did you hear? He will draw near to us. We humble ourselves before God, realizing that He is God. We're saying, Great are you, Lord. Do we really believe that? Do we, do we go, do we take that? You know, if we, he will draw near to us if we humble ourselves before him. And the wars between us as believers will cease. If our eyes focus upon God and his purpose for our lives alone, then there will not be conflict within the family of God. We need to empty ourselves of self and sin and be filled instead with the Holy Spirit. You know, to be humble before God is to realize that you come to Him not in, on the basis of your own strength, but on the basis of His. We can't fix that. He can. A truly humble person is one who has seen himself as he really is in the sight of God and has repented of his sin and is following Jesus as Lord of all. Let me remind you, if a man stands against the devil in his own strength, he will prove him a coward. Will not be able to stand. You see, only when a person realizes his own ignorance will he ask for God's wisdom. Only when a person realizes his own poverty in the things that matter will he pray for the riches of God's grace. And only when a man realizes his own weaknesses in necessary things 
will he come to call upon God's strength. And only when a man realizes his own sin will he realize his need of a Savior and forgiveness. You see, we use the wrong measuring stick when it comes to our relationship with God. Philip Brooks said that the true way to become humble is not to stoop until you are smaller than yourself, but to stand at your real height against some higher nature that will show you what the real smallness of your greatness is. If we compare ourselves up against God Almighty, it will show us, no matter how great we think we are, just how small we are. Just how small we are. But the wonderful thing about that is, being small in the face of our relationship compared to God should not be a scary thing. Why? Because He loves us. He loves us. He loves us just like we are. He cares for us just like we are. Warts and wrinkles and everything. That's what Jesus died for, is the love of God in our lives. And how can we not stand before Him realizing how great He is, how wonderful He is, how powerful He is, and how small we are. See, the problem that we have is that we are pretty proud of ourselves. We think we're pretty good. We look at what the world has done, and all the things that have been created and invented and all this sort of stuff, you know, and, and all the things that we've been able to, to create and manufacture, and we think we're pretty smart, and we think we're all this sort of stuff. Then you realize that God created the world out of nothing. He didn't use stuff that somebody else had made. He created it out of nothing. All he had to do was speak it. Our God is an awesome God. And we need to make sure that as we go through our lives that we don't forget that. As His children, we need to embrace that relationship in humility and gratitude for the blessing of God. So I hope as you go through each week, that as you go through each day, you will look around you at the greatness of God in every way that you see. I have, I'm becoming a health nut. Yeah, y'all believe that, right? But I've started walking every day. You know, from there, and, 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 I, and I walk a mile and a half every morning, okay? So, yeah, y'all can go ahead and plot if you want to. That's all right. But I walk a mile and a half every morning, and it's my time to talk to God when I go down the road while I'm dodging log trucks and stuff like that, you know? But as you watch the world work up, wake up each morning, you know, and you see all the things that are around you, you can become totally blown away by what God has put together, you know, what He has made here. You know, and you realize just how small you are. But in, <laughs> we may be small, but I'm pretty sure that God has my picture on his mouth. You know, God has his, my picture on his mouth. He has yours too. He has yours too. Because that's how much he loves us. I hope you'll take the opportunity to share that with someone. That you might have the opportunity this week to witness to someone who may not know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And if you feel that God has touched your heart and, and maybe you, you want to talk a little bit more about what that means to live a life that is pleasing to God, or maybe you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you know, all you got to do is give me a call. Drop me an email. We'll set up a time. We'll sit down and talk. And I'll answer any questions you've got and help you understand what it means to belong to Jesus as your Lord and Savior from there. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the blessings that we have of knowing that, that we matter to you and that we can just reach out and take your hand at any given time. We don't have to face Satan alone, but you are with us. It's not that you're standing behind us. You're standing in front of us. You're standing right there. And Lord, I pray as we go through each day that we might glorify you through the way we live our lives. We might love each other just like you love us and the world will see the difference and desire what we have. Keep us safe. Keep us in the center of your will, Father. And we ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Before you go, let me tell you a couple things. Okay? Let me remind you, when you leave here, we ask you to go out the building. Uh, don't stand around the hallways. And you know, If you want to talk, that's fine, but go outside. We don't need to be in closed space. Also, if you brought your tithes and offerings with you, the offering plates are on the counter out front. You can drop in there or in the boxes on the walls before you go. <clears throat> On a more personal manner, whether you believe 
everything you read or everything that you see about the pandemic and the coronavirus. Whether you buy all the information we're getting one way or another, let me stress to you, take care of yourselves. The numbers in Florida are going up. Uh, they, we, the last seven days were the highest days we've had since this began, which means it's not going away. You know, Even though we're lucky enough, there's not been a whole lot more deaths associated with it and hospitalizations are not as high as we'd anticipate, it's still there. And so we're enjoying being free. We're enjoying, you know, taking the chains off where we can go everywhere and do what we want to. But be careful. I went out to the grocery store this last week and I was extremely uncomfortable while I was in there because me and three other people were, were, were social distancing and wearing masks. The rest of the people were like nothing has ever happened. And the problem about it is, is that can blow up on us. And when it blows up on us, it's too late to do anything about it that point in time so please take care of yourself you know be diligent you know even though you may not i hate wearing masks you know when you wear glasses all you do is wind up with fogged up glasses all day long when you do that and can't breathe through half of them i hate not being able to go and do what i want to do whenever i want to go and do it i hate to even have to think about being safe when i go out somewhere but it's important it's important to stay healthy so that we can take care of each other. Remember, do it for yourself. More than anything, do it for the person standing beside you or the person walking beside you or the person sitting beside you or in front of you from there. I encourage you to do that because I, I don't want any of you to miss out on the chances that we come together and worship. Hope you have a great rest of Father's Day. Enjoy the times with your families. And don't forget, we have Zoom meeting on, on uh, uh, Wednesday night, beginning at 7 o'clock. Come join the crowd. We've been having a good time as we look at God's word and we get, we get a chance to, to visit. We had, we had a long meeting Wednesday night because we had a, an unlimited time frame. <clears throat> and I, I thought, I don't know how long everybody stayed after I went home uh, as far as that's concerned, but we got a chance to fellowship, check up on people, pray for each other and go through that process. It's part of what bonds us together as a church family. Whatever we can do for you, you can get a hold of the staff anywhere you want to. We're usually here at the office. Give us a call and we'll, we'll help you out with whatever you need to do. And let us know if somebody needs something particular that maybe we don't know about uh, from there. Keep David Parnell in your prayers as he's recuperating uh, from his surgery. Also, uh, Pat Strickland, Florzell Strickland. Uh, somebody else. I can't remember who it was. Margie Owens, right. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Little, pink, little, little pinker, pinker, little pinker. All right. Okay. Have a good rest of the day. Pray for each other on a regular basis. Most of all, submit yourself to God and he'll draw near to you. Look forward to seeing you again come next Sunday. Have a rest, good rest of the day. You are dismissed. <laughs>